Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? The Matrix is an iconic turn-of-the-century film that causes us to question our reality. We see jarring images of brain-computer interfaces that give Neo the ability to move through digital realities. But, is the technology within the Matrix realistic? Could we someday experience simulations that are indistinguishable from reality? I'm Harrison. And I'm Colin. And we are neurotech researchers and entrepreneurs working to make a brain-controlled future. Neurotechnology means devices that stimulate or are controlled by brain signals. This tech will one day allow you to interact with your technology just by thinking about it. We have experience doing research, teaching, and developing out brain-computer interfaces. In this video series, we are going to talk about brain-computer interfaces in media and how long we think it will be before these devices will show up. The Matrix is a 1999 sci-fi action film that depicts a dystopian future in which humanity is unknowingly trapped inside the Matrix, which is a simulated reality created by intelligent machines to distract humans while using their bodies as an energy source. When the computer programmer Thomas Anderson, under the hacker alias Neo, uncovers the truth, he is drawn into a rebellion against the machines along with other people who have been freed by the Matrix. The implantable BCI in the Matrix is called the Head Jack. It's located at the back of the brain and provides Neo with full sensory input to the Matrix. It allows him to control his avatar within the Matrix, learn new skills through the BCI, and also dilate time. We also see implanted spinal electrodes along with some nutrients uh, tubes that go into to Neo. And we see a muscle stimulator later in the movie, uh, which allows him to build muscle strength uh, for the muscles that he hasn't used before. For something like the head jack to work, you would need to be able to interact with all five senses and take motor commands from the brain. So first, let's start with movement so that you can control your virtual self. All of your conscious motor commands are controlled right here at the top of the brain in an area called the motor cortex. The signals then go down your pyramidal tract and into the spinal cord to control your muscles. In the matrix, the machine interfaces with the spinal cord at the base of the skull, so it must be interfacing with that tract since we don't see any electrodes up on the top of the brain. There's actually a ton of research and even some products that enable effective mind control of devices. Most of these devices are built to help paralyzed people communicate and move. Research subjects have successfully controlled complex robotic systems, avatars, and even used computer interfaces to type and talk. All of the original research is linked below if you're interested. The next key to this puzzle is getting information from the senses. Let's start with vision. Visual information is processed right here at the back of the brain. This area is called the occipital lobe and conveniently is right where the brain implant is located. By placing electrodes in this area, researchers have already been able to project low res black and white images directly into the brain. This is especially useful for the blind. So what about sound? Well, I'm sure we've all heard of the cochlear implant before. These have been turning digital information into brain signals for years, and nearly 100,000 Americans have been implanted with one. However, in the matrix, there's no evidence of an implant into the cochlea, which is located in the ear. And it's possible that the head jack bypasses the ear altogether and hooks directly into the brainstem. This has been shown to be possible with the use of an auditory brainstem implant. There are similar examples for taste, touch, and smell too. One study documents brain surgery from the 1950s, where a surgeon was able to evoke a foul smell in his patients by stimulating the olfactory bulb with electricity. Could you imagine going through open brain surgery and suddenly smelling rotten eggs for no reason? Crazy stuff. It's been theorized that this phenomenon can be fine-tuned with more advanced electrodes to create most olfactory sensations in humans. Remember that scene where Cypher is marveling at the taste of that delicious steak in the Matrix? Turns out, this also has some basis in scientific fact. One study actually showed the possibility of adding more taste sensations to subjects, resulting in tasting things that could never have occurred naturally. Imagine the possibility of a virtual reality cuisine, where you can taste literally anything, and with zero calories no less. Sounds like the diet of the future. 
Within the Matrix, we see a few specific scenes where Neo's mind is uploaded certain skills, allowing him to master them faster than would normally be possible. This suggests that Neo's brain is being rewired on the neurological level, much quicker than normal experiences would allow. Currently, this is purely science fiction. There's no scientific literature in which brains or neural networks are directly stimulated to learn new skills. However, there is some evidence that certain artists, Mozart, for example, can speed up memory and retention of learned material. One study found that the alpha band EEG pattern of individuals studying or learning new material increased after listening to Mozart. The alpha band, by the way, is linked to memory, cognition, and problem solving. So we want to reiterate again that there really isn't scientific basis for the idea of injecting a memory into someone's brain. And the reason for that is because memory works by repetition. You have to continually stimulate specific neurons uh, to form a memory and to form learning. And there are certain physical limits to the brain and to neurons for how this is possible. For example, neurons are generally not capable of firing more than a thousand hertz, which translates to about one millisecond. Additionally, uh, electrical impulses within the brain roughly travel at 268 miles per hour. That's the speed of a thought. But this is significantly shorter than the speed of light which you would need to be able to stimulate the brain at that speed. These factors create a hard cap on how quickly the brain could react to certain events. Within the Matrix, there are several scenes where Neo slows down time and is even completely able to stop time for individuals other than himself. This is more science fiction. While we do experience time dilation when remembering a traumatic event, this isn't because our perception at that time was slower, but that our heightened state caused more memories to form faster with more details. Thus, our memory seems like it's slowed. Another piece of technology that we see in the Matrix are these long needles that seem to go into every muscle in Neo's body. There's actually a parallel technology that we have today called electromyostimulation that tries to accomplish a similar goal but it only has a pretty marginal effect, so it's really only useful for people who are completely bedridden or possibly stroke victims. It wouldn't be all that useful for you if you were just trying to build extra muscle at the gym. So Harrison, ethical question for you. Sure. Would it be ethical to hook somebody up into a BCI like we see in the Matrix? I mean, it depends, right? Because I think that there are tremendous positive possibilities, but there are also a lot of ways that the system could be abused. So those are important to look at. For example, a malicious party could theoretically uh, force users to experience certain experiences and do and do different things. That's things like pain or uh, right. things that aren't comfortable, basically. Right, exactly. Um, you could also induce physiological harm, like inducing seizures, um, and potentially you know, influence someone's thought patterns. And that stuff is all really, really scary. Um, but that's exactly why we want to have this conversation right now, because it's important that we get ahead of that. And I think that that shouldn't overshadow the potential possibilities of being able to enter into a simulation and create these different simulations. Because as we saw, you might be able to learn a lot faster um, in the matrix. And if you could imagine using this in uh, a productivity way or maybe in therapy, I think there are tremendous possibilities for this to be positive. Yeah, that being said, we'd love to hear your thoughts about this, right. uh, because the ethics is one of the most important parts of brain computer interfaces. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to sort of set the standard, as Harrison was saying, um, before the, the, the software and hardware is actually there, so that when we have this software and hardware someday, right. um, we, d we develop it correctly and, and uh, these sort of ethical questions are already taken care of. Right. Yeah. And as, as we said before, we've got we've got time before any of this stuff becomes a becomes a problem. But that's why we got to talk about it now. And so if you're interested in taking that conversation even further, there are neuroethics groups and uh, groups in charge of creating policy around biohacking um, that will link down below if you're interested. So I want to get into the plausibility of the BCI that we see in the Matrix now. Um, now, I'm going to give this a plausibility of score of eight out of ten. Um, and that's because there are quite a bit of similarities uh, from the head jack to modern day implantable electrodes. That being said, it's still really difficult to target specific areas of the brain in the detail that we see uh, within the matrix. Now, just because this task is difficult for us, that is humanity, that doesn't necessarily mean that an advanced artificial intelligence like exists in the matrix uh, would find these problems very difficult. Now, given the likelihood of AI to advance dramatically by 2100, um, I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10 score because uh, I believe that 
artificial intelligences won't struggle with dealing with the large amounts of data and filtering that goes into brain computer interfaces mm. um, that uh, humans struggle with. Right, and you, you could say that because right now one of the biggest challenges is that we need to advance our machine learning algorithms to be able to make sense of all of this brain data that we're collecting. Right. Um, I think we'll see implantable devices that are similar to the head jack in all but form factor um, by the 2040s. Um, and I think that these devices will be indistinguishable from the head jack in all but, like I said, the form factor. Uh, there's no way that we're going to have this giant sort of head, like headphone plug <laughs> that you plug into your back of your brain. Yeah, That's a the... Apple would have something to say about that. <laughs> we'll need a dongle someday for the thing that we s stick into the back of our heads. I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think that, that the Matrix got a lot of it right. Um, okay. The one thing that they got wrong, though, was just this giant plug. There's no, that's not going to be necessary. Surface electrodes could, for the most part, capture a lot of, 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 of the things that we're seeing. Surface electrodes on the brain. Sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I would give it a 7 out of 10, so, which is still um, quite ambitious, I think, in terms of saying how possible this could be. But my main concern with the system is the form factor, because it is a massive system that would be damaging a lot of brain tissue. Um, and it's just really not positioned well. As Colin said, we would need to have distributed electrodes around the brain targeting motor and sensory areas for something like this to be realistic. And right now, um, we're trying to build up capacity to have more electrodes go in those areas. Um, however, the concept of being able to enter into a simulated world using a brain-computer interface, uh, which I think is really what is at the core of the matrix here, rather than what the actual device is, I think that's very much possible. I mean, there are already examples right now with using non-invasive technologies and VR and biofeedback on the body, we'll link some down below, um, that make the experience feel very immersive and almost addicting to users. And they know that it's a game. And so I think in the future, uh, the feasibility of being able to actually enter into an interface, a video game, a movie, um, an operating system, things like that would be very, very possible. And I'm excited for that future. So feel free to continue this conversation about the Matrix on we our website, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and in the comments down below. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be talking about um, media like this in the future. Right. Uh, so if you have any specific examples of BCIs in media that you'd like us to cover, uh, make sure you comment that down below. And we'll take a look at it, and maybe we'll cover it in a future video. Yeah, definitely. And let us know. We, we can go into more depth or less depth. So just let us know uh, where you think the content should sit. We really appreciate that feedback. Thank you.